So this is my story. And it actually is a story where I returned from the edge of death um, to where I am today. I think it's pertinent, it's exciting, and I'd like to get into it with you. Uh, let's start at the beginning. So way back in 2013, I began to understand and practice a paleo diet and lifestyle, and I actually incorporated it with the periodontal treatment that I was doing for my patients. And amazingly, they were getting quite improved results once I integrated the diet, especially, and the lifestyle changes. And at that time, I was 66 years old. And I was writing about this, I was lecturing about it, I was consulting, actually doing consulting um, through Skype all around the world, and I was actually treating patients in a clinical environment. And then in 2018, I was um, actually uh, honored by being invited to speak at Paleo FX in Austin, Texas. And I really considered myself a primer poster boy for seniors, um, just espousing the benefits of a primal lifestyle diet and its potentially beneficial effects on all kinds of chronic diseases, including periodontal disease, which is what I was treating. So in April of 2018, I was um, going to Paleo FX in Austin, Texas, and, and obviously I had to fly from Charleston, South Carolina to Austin. And generally, um, wherever I go, because my city is not a direct um, hub, I have to make a, a uh, connection flight, usually in Atlanta. So I was in Atlanta, and generally when I go to Atlanta or any other airport, and I have enough time between connections, I like to walk. So I put my bag on my right shoulder, and I walk from Concourse A to Concourse C, where my connect connecting flight was. And I noticed that when I got to my connecting flight, my shoulder was starting to get rather sore. Nothing ever happened like that, but I, I wasn't so, so concerned about it. I went to the meeting, I did my talk, um, which was exciting and fun and returned home. And I still had this sh shoulder soreness right on my right rotator cuff area. And I figured I must have done something and whatever I did, um, maybe it would get better. However, uh, from April until August, it, it really didn't get better. Actually, the pain from my shoulder went to my back and then it went to my chest. And, and I, I could not figure out what was going on. Um, finally, I succumbed to, you know, uh, realizing somebody else had to take a look at me. So I went to my physician, who I had been seeing for over 30-some years, and so I said to Billy, I, I've got this problem, it's soreness, he did an exam, he didn't find anything, although he confirmed that my shoulder was hurting, my chest, my, my back was hurting, my chest was hurting, um, obviously. And so he took some blood tests and all the blood tests amazingly came back normal. The normal blood tests came back normal, except he took a, a C-reactive protein, CRP, which tests for chronic or systemic inflammation and it was elevated. And that was the only thing that was elevated and it didn't make sense to me because it usually was very, very low. So then he suggested, let's do an MRI. Maybe we can figure out exactly what's going on. So we did an MRI and he got the results and he called me on the phone and he said, Al, do you want to come in to the office? We'll discuss it or just discuss it over the phone. I said, of course, Billy, let's talk about it over the phone. How bad could it be? So then he talked about what he saw on the MRI. I had a compression fracture in my vertebra of T4. I had a soft tissue mass that was growing on the side of T6. I had two rib fractures, a hairline fracture in my pelvis, innumerable bone lesions like a person that has severe osteoporosis. And he almost chuckled and said, did you get into a fight or did you fall down some stairs? And I said, of course not. What's going on? He said that we needed to get involved with an oncologist. And the oncologist did a whole 
another battery of tests. He did a CT biopsy on the soft tissue lesion around my um, vertebra of T6. He did a PET scan. A PET scan is a CT scan that actually um, injects a radioactive glucose liquid into my vein so that if there are any cancer cells, the glucose would be eaten up by the cancer cells and it would show on this scan. So we would know where the cancer cells were if there were cancer cells. And then a whole other battery of blood tests to identify specific types of cancer cells. Turns out that all these tests came up with a diagnosis of IgA kappa, light chain multiple myeloma, it's a big name, for a serious bone marrow cancer, which is incurable. In other words, I'm going to die from this disease. I needed to let that settle in. And then my prognosis was only three to six months to live at that point. And this was in September of 2018. I thought, and my oncologist thought, that I could be dead by December 2018. So he recommended some immediate treatment. He recommended a cocktail of chemotherapy drugs. These are chemicals that are extremely caustic. It would kill maybe cancerous, a whole lot of other stuff in my body. I was having severe chest pain, almost couldn't breathe because of the cancer in some of the ribs that was uh, affecting my lungs. So uh, he recommended some radiation just to take care of the pain. It wouldn't treat the, the cancer at all, but kill the lesion that was causing the pain that was um, uh, causing me problems with bleeding. And then maybe later stem cell therapy, but he explained that all these treatments, including stem cell therapy, would probably eventually not work. And eventually more drugs, more different chemical infusions into my body until I succumbed to the disease of this multiple myeloma. The quality of life was paramount for me. I didn't care how long I lived. I did care if I lived with a decreasing quality of life. And anything I could do to maintain quality of life was what I wanted to do. So, you know, let's go back and have a bigger view here. We as humans are born to be healthy. I wasn't healthy today or at that time. And I needed to figure out what the hell was going on. I thought I was an unbelievably healthy person. At the age of 71, I was feeling on top of the world. And all of a sudden, September 19th, 2018, I was given this diagnosis. This guy, Josh Billings, kind of said it right. And basically, he said, it ain't so much the things that we don't know that get us in trouble. It's the things we know that just ain't so. So, you know, if you were sitting in an airplane on the tarmac, you have a view of what's going around you, but it's a very limited view. You need to get up over the clouds and get a real good perspective of everything that's going on. And I needed to get a better perspective of what was happening in my body. Um, the immediate treatment plan of caustic chemicals destroying my system, and maybe we could improve it artificially later on, and maybe I would go into remission, but I would still die from this disease, was not something I was comfortable with. So cancer is considered, or by many people, a disease of genetic damage, DNA damage. However, there's much more to cancer than the genes. It's basically epigenetics. Our genes are our blueprint for living in this world, in our body. But epigenetics are actually the combination of everything that goes on in our environment. What we touch, what we get into our body, anything that affects our body outside of our gene pool actually is our genetic or epigenetic environment. And it turns out that things that happen in our environment to us represent 90% of the way genes either express themselves in a positive way or get repressed. So if I had a genetic disposition to cancer, I could repress that gene if I did things correctly 
epigenetically or changing diet and lifestyle. So the causes of cancer are specifically and primarily diseases of, a, or, or cancer is a disease of metabolic dysfunction, meaning diet and the way nutrients are actually used by our body and mitochondrial dysfunction, which actually are the, the, the energy or batteries of our cell. You know, if, if you had a flashlight and you put batteries in the flashlight and you turn the flashlight on, the light obviously would light. And if you kept the light on, eventually it would dim because the batteries were weakened and eventually the weakened batteries would die and the light would go out. The mitochondria in our cells are like the batteries in a flashlight. Some cells have two or 300 mitochondria per cell. Some cells that are very, very active with energy have several thousand mitochondria in their cells. And even if the mitochondria start to weaken for whatever reasons, the cell can still function, but not at its peak performance until the mitochondria literally dies and the cell would die. So cancer is a disease of metabolic dysfunction and mitochondrial dysfunction. Something is damaging the mitochondria. And also genetic predisposition plays a part, but a very minor part in the development and the progression of cancer. So I realized that, I learned that, and I started to investigate just for my own information because I couldn't do anything about it at this point, what could cause my cancer? So cancer is just one malignant cell that doesn't die naturally. Um, cancer actually is in everybody all the time. We all have malignant cells, but our immune system knows how to either eat it up or the actual malignant cell gets triggered by certain chemical reactions within it to cause it to die or commit suicide. So cancer normally doesn't spread in our bodies because our immune system stops it or the cancer cell dies. I think I developed my cancer way back was when I was in dental school in the early 70s. Interestingly, there was a study that was published in 2014 that, that looked at a cohort of male dentists, my age group. So it was male dentists aged 55 to 75 compared to the male population of that age group of 55 to 75. And it turned out that male dentists in the 55 to 75 age group had a significantly higher prevalence of cancer, specifically multiple myeloma, than the other age group of the male population. Now, the paper didn't really relate why that was the case, but I looked into my own life in dental school, and here's what I figured out. Low-dose ionizing radiation is definitely a cause of multiple myeloma, which is a malignancy of plasma cells in the bone marrow. Low ionizing radiation are the, is the radiation that is emitted from dental x-ray machines. And when I was in dental school in the clinics, I was there for four years as a, uh, preparing to be a dentist and then two years for graduate work in periodontics, I was situated among four different dentists. We had little modules and all four of us shared one x-ray machine and there were about 120 dental students in the dental clinic. So there were many, many areas of x-ray machines in the clinic that were going on and off at various times and I didn't know that and I didn't know how well they were controlled or, or collimated and I certainly didn't know if I was that protected. I, you just didn't know these things in those days. So I think that all of the low-dose ionizing radiation for six years may be triggered one plasma cell to become malignant. In addition, we used free mercury in dentistry. We put free mercury, this wonderful silvery stuff, almost looks like a liquid, but it's a metal, a heavy metal, and we put it in a powder and mixed it up, 
and it, we call it dental amalgam. And we placed these in teeth that had tooth decay. And that was a major way to restore a tooth in those days. And unfortunately, it's still done today. But the free mercury, mercury is extremely toxic, neurotoxic. And not only was it used in these restorations, but we played with free mercury like kids play with uh, Play-Doh today. And we, when we had to um, squeeze the excess mercury from this powdered ma amalgam that we mixed, we threw the little pellets of mercury on the floor, which vaporized. So the dental school was a, a, a sea of, of toxic material that we didn't realize. So the free mercury and the low dose ionizing radiation that I was exposed to over the continuous period of six years, I think stimulated one plasma cell in my body to become malignant. And because of that, and maybe other toxic loads along the way, again, this was in the 1970s, it took over 40 years for that cancer to manifest in my body in a clinical way. So, so you know, I, I was given all of a sudden this diagnosis and prognosis, and I, I was at a point where I had to make a decision. You know, if you were standing on some railroad tracks and you heard a train coming, what would you do? I, I needed to decide what I would do. Would I go for this chemotherapy that would destroy my body, decrease the quality of my life would never cure me, but maybe put me in remission here and there? Or would I do something differently? And I decided to reject chemotherapy. So I've never had chemical intervention like chemotherapy in my blood system. I did elect and I needed to have some radiation in the areas of my severe rib pain because I couldn't breathe properly. I, I, you know, I, I was in just excruciating pain. Um, and I decided I needed to do something, investigate some method to improve my immune system to maybe promote some natural healing in my body. And my overwhelming goal was to maintain a quality of life, like I mentioned. And longevity was just not part of my goal. I'd like to live a long time, but I had to live with a quality of life. So I started to investigate some unconventional cancer protocols. And what I mean, what I mean by unconventional is that these protocols that I'm going to describe have some research behind them, but they've never been proven to cure cancer, specifically my form of multiple myeloma. But they are unconventional because they're not part of mainstream medicine today. Although tomorrow, next year, 10 years from now, this may be the way to treat cancer. I think it is, by the way, as you'll see. So I did some investigation and I, and I saw different areas that I needed to get a handle on and improve within my body. One was diet, another was a, a healthy gut, um, an enhanced immune system, improved bone metabolism, specifically because my cancer of multiple myeloma was destroying my bone structure, creating all of these holes in my bone, like I mentioned, and cr making my bones extremely fragile, as you'll see in a moment. I needed to do something to help my mitochondria that were damaged because cancer is a disease of mitochondrial dysfunction, I needed to do something to help repair my mitochondria in general. And I needed over a course of time to do maybe some targeted immunotherapy, not chemotherapy, but immunotherapy, specific types of antibodies that attack specific cancer cells, which I'll explain. And I needed to engage in some very efficient exercise. So my diet was actually a paleo type diet until I was diagnosed in um, September 2018. And then I went to a paleo autoimmune diet because it was very 
um, helpful with chronic diseases, and of course, cancer was a chronic disease. But I started to investigate another type of diet called a carnivore diet, which I totally was ignorant about. But I found out that a carnivore diet had some very significant results with people that had incurable chronic diseases, and specifically for me, incurable types of cancer. I did some research in a, uh, around a clinic called Paleo Medicina Clinic in Budapest, Hungary, where they were doing a very strict animal-based diet, which they called a Paleolithic ketogenic diet. And they were using that diet exclusively, no supplements, no other medications. And they were using it with patients, like I said, with chronic disease, but my my emphasis was the clinical reports that were published about incurable cancers that this clinic was treating with this type of animal-based diet. And they were getting not only remission or some repair, but they actually were getting cures of different cancers. That blew me away. So what a carnivore diet will do if you're eating it in the way I'm going to describe, is put your body into ketosis. So when you have cancer, the cancer cells just love glucose because they're not producing their energy normally, but glucose, as they ferment it, is a major source for their energy. Glutamine is another um, amino acid that they can ferment to get energy, but glucose is their preferred. And if I and in ketosis, I'm limiting the amount of glucose that's in my body, and therefore I may be starving some cancer cells. And there's some research that suggests that this is the case. And to get into ketosis in a carnivore diet, I need to eat fat to protein ratios of two to one or greater, and this is a fat to protein ratio in grams, not um, calories. So two grams of fat per one gram of protein is what I needed in the type of foods that I was eating. And I didn't want to eat too much enough that I was being satisfied. And of course, fat is going to give me plenty of satisf satisfaction. And I would eat maybe one really, really good and possibly two meals a day. But I did take some supplements. And one of the supplements as part of the diet is a real carnivore diet emphasizes not just muscle meat, because that's not really a healthy diet. It's emphasizing the organ meats, which where, is where many, many nutrients are, the fat itself, and other collagenous material. But to make, make sure that I really got what was in the organs, because I wasn't eating organs every day, um, I also supplemented my diet on a daily basis with desiccated organ complex and desiccated bone marrow. So the diet is probably the most critical element to my protocol, and I have been very, very um, strict with this diet since January 1st, 2020. My gut is another critical factor because the gut microbiome and its epithelial barrier is critical for the immune system as well as preventing any inflammation systemically. So I needed to be very aware and very responsive to improving my gut microbiome, the mucus layer that actually is between the lumen and the epithelial barrier or, or the membrane of the gut. To do that, I started taking spore-based probiotics. Now, spore-based probiotics are not like regular probiotics. Spore-based probiotics are very natural, but the spores are resistant to stomach acid. And when you eat the spores and they get through your stomach acid without being harmed, they can get into your intestines and actually um, um, germinate. So the spore-based probiotics do two things. They germinate, they live, they multiply in your gut, actually enhancing your other commensal bacteria but, and improving their quantity and quality. But also spore-based 
probiotics, make metabolites or chemicals that are very, very helpful to other bacteria as well as the mucus layer and the epithelial barrier. So this is a critical type of probiotic and that's what I was going to take and I did take. I also was taking some oligosac um, oligosaccharide prebiotics. Prebiotics were feeding the probiotics. These are fibers. But fiber is not critical, especially in a carnivore diet, which is interesting. The bacteria in the gut actually can feed off of amino acids and produce the short chain fatty acids that they will produce from fiber. So even if you're not getting fiber from plant foods in a carnivore diet, you're not um, damaging or compromising the microbiome because the microbiome can make all the short chain fatty acids that it needs to make from amino acids. So I also was taking some amino acids and some immunoglobulins to support this mucus layer and to gobble up some lipopolysaccharides, which are normally in the lumen of the gut, but if they were to leak into the bloodstream, it would call, cause what's called metabolic endotoxemia, and that would cause severe systemic inflammation, and that would damage other organs and help progress the cancer that I had. And of course, I needed to make sure my barrier, my epithelial barrier of the gut was intact. And all of these things were done gut protocol. Then I needed to make sure I had a healthy immune system. Now, a healthy diet and a healthy gut improve the immune system without a doubt. Probably they're the two major reasons why the immune system could be very healthy. But I needed to make sure that I had an ideal adaptive and innate immune system. And I did some other things to enhance that. And what I was doing was taking herbal extracts. Now I was taking echinacea, and I still take echinacea, astragalus, and um, Korean ginseng, but I was taking it in the liquid extracted form rather than capsules because capsules or tablets had a variety of extra ingredients. They had preservatives, they had binders, they had emulsifiers, they had chemicals that not, were not good for my gut microbiome. I just wanted the herbal extracts pure, in a pure fashion. So I was taking the combination of echinacea, astragalus, and um, Korean ginseng, and also supplementing vitamin D3 and vitamin K2. And that also improves the immune system as well as bone metabolism metabolism that I'm going to explain in a moment. So my bone metabolism was really a critical thing for me to be um, aware of because my bones could fracture very easily and I did have many pathological fractures along the way as I'll explain. So I was improving my bone ma metabolism by taking vitamin D3, 10,000 units is what I took, um, vitamin K2, a form of M, which was a form of MK7, um, anywhere from 320 to 640 micrograms. Um, and I was taking some products that had calcium that was actually um, harvested from seaweed and some magnesium. And that would help my bone metabolism. Another critical factor was my mitochondria. As I explained, cancer is a disease of mitochondrial dysfunction as well as metabolic dysfunction. So metabolic dysfunction meant that my, I mean, my, I, I mean mitochondrial dysfunction meant that my mitochondria, especially my cancer cells, were not working well. And we needed, I needed to do whatever was um, natural to repair that. And what I did was investigated and started what's called pulsed electromagnetic field therapy. Now, pulsed electromagnetic field therapy are very low frequency um, electromagnetic fields that are pulsed and they represent or replicate some of the energy frequencies in the human body. You know, the, the human body is an electrical machine and we run on electricity. And this pulsed electromagnetic fields that are generated by this therapy helps to regulate the natural frequencies that support 
and maintain a healthy mitochondria or mitochondrion. So I was using a full body mat. It's kind of like a yoga mat that is in my bed under the sheets. And I use it actually three to four times a day. And it with a, a certain um, protocol and it improves the millivoltage potential from the outside to the inside of the cell. And that's so important because this millivoltage potential allows for different mineral ions and a variety of other things to go back and forth, especially calcium channeling, because when calcium gets into the cell and it starts to accumulate, it can damage the cell and even kill the cell. So having the right millivoltage potential between the outside and inside of the cell allows for other ions, including calcium, to be removed from the cell as necessary. And also, when I use pulse electromagnetic field therapy, it enhanced the mitochondria's production of ATP. So as I mentioned, mitochondria is the battery of the cell. The battery needs to create energy. The energy is created by what's called the electron transport chain. These are just protein complexes within the mitochondria that produce ATP, and that is the source of energy for the entire human body. And the vitamin K2 that I was also using to support my bone metabolism also supports and helps heal dysfunctional mitochondria. So these are actually my protocols as I've elaborated that I started right in the beginning of my diagnosis by rejecting chemotherapy. I needed this natural way to get my body healing properly. And then as time went on, my oncologist found a, a, a one or two immunotherapies that were just approved by the FDA, which were not chemotherapies, but actually very specific human-derived monoclonal antibodies. These antibodies actually could affect and kill some cancer cells. So I started two different monoclonal antibodies. One was called Darzalex, and it was given by infusion. And it attaches to a specific protein on a malignant plasma cells, because my disease, my cancer, is a disease of malignant plasma cells within the bone marrow. So this Darzalex literally attaches to this protein and either causes the malignant plasma cell to kill itself by apoptosis, or and or it stimulates the immune system to send a whole bunch of macrophages to the area to gobble up these dying or or dead malignant plasma cells. The other um, human derived monoclonal antibody that I began was called Exgiva, and that's a again a human derived um, antibody that inactivates a specific structure on the osteoclasts that helps prevent the damage to the bone that's caused by this cancer. So the two immunotherapies I included, integrated into my unconventional cancer protocols to again help my body heal in a more natural way. I was not putting chemicals in my body that was damaging my other cells um, like chemotherapy would do. My protocol also included an exercise program. In the beginning, um, I could only do so much, but it was a progressive pro program. And I got to the point where I was walking and, and actually doing stretches with my legs and arms and, and modified push-ups and squats, but I certainly couldn't do that in the beginning. That just wouldn't work for me. Um, but I had some major setbacks. And along the way, my chemistries were doing quite well, but I never got a handle on the holes in my skeleton. And I never got a handle and didn't really understand what a pathological fracture would be. A pathological fracture is where your weight is too great because the bone is so damaged that your weight or twisting motion could literally fracture a bone. And that's what ha actually happened. I had, um, uh, during the course of this progression, I had another um, vertebra that had a 
compression fracture around L3, which created some serious pain in the lower back in my legs. I had a fracture on my left femur, the fracture of the lesser trochanter, um, just a, a small part of the femur got broken. But on August 21st, 2019, I had a severe setback. I had a life-threatening setback. I was in my bathroom, brushing and flossing my teeth. Of course, I know how to do that pretty well. And I was standing in front of my sink. And after I flossed, I, well, my feet were planted on the floor. And I turned to my left to throw the dental floss away in the trash can. So if you can envision this, my foot, especially my right foot, is planted on the floor. I twisted to the left about 90 degrees. And as soon as that twisting occurred, in that split second, my right femur snapped in half. I collapsed to the floor. When I hit the floor, broke some ribs, and split my right humerus in half, I was in excruciating pain. Um, more pain than you can imagine. And whatever you can imagine, just multiply that by 10. Um, my I was screaming. My wife came into the room. She called um, EMS. People came to the house. They, they got me on a stretcher. Um, they got me to the hospital. And they repaired this right femur because if they didn't, then it could have fractured or um, ruptured my femoral, um, the femoral artery, and I could have bled to death. So that was taken care of. They didn't, at that time, take care of my right humerus. Because of all of this, I stopped all my protocols. And I gave up. I actually gave up. And the hospital sent me to hospice. Hospice to, to actually die. And so um, I went to hospice. And here you can see my right femur, between the arrows, you can see the bone literally snapped in half. And that was a pathological fracture from just twisting 90 degrees with my right foot planted on the floor, twisting to the left, and it snapped in half like a chicken bone. Interestingly, all this happened at the end of August 2019, and September 4th, a hurricane was actually bearing down on Charleston, South Carolina, and it was coming at a speed of like a 185 miles an hour, which was amazing. And this hurricane was so threatening, the hospital, the hospice hospital, were, was um, ordered to evacuate. They had no place to send me. My wife, who's an RN, uh, scampered to find a hospital bed to get delivered to my home, and they evacuated me to my home. I was still in hospice, at home, and still preparing to die. I was on heavy narcotics, so I was pretty drugged. I had a catheter. I had to use a bedpan. It was so demoralizing the way I was living, but living to die in my home. But all of a sudden, getting home was actually the beginning of a miraculous recovery. My wife, who is amazing, uh, gave me some tough love. She basically showed me that I'm not a victim, that I actually am a survivor. And she helped me change my life around. And by mid-September of 2019, I began to rally. Uh, I started back with my unconventional cancer protocols that I mentioned to you previously. Uh, my wife got a physical therapist to come into the house to help me get out and sit up in bed, get out of bed, even start walking. I actually got rid of this catheter, which is an amazing uh, experience in, a, in of itself, and started to use a bathroom normally. And I began to get around in the house with a walker. And, and actually, um, I was able to get outside and start walking um, on my driveway with a walker uh, and felt much more normal. Today, 
I was thriving. And from then on, I started thriving. I had excellent energy, uh, except by maybe 7 to 7.30 at night, I started to get really tired, but pretty much good energy and a very strong immune system. And I think the immune system is definitely the result of my cancer protocols. And I'll give you a, a little story behind this. Maybe four months, three to four months ago, before the COVID situation here in, in the United States, I was at and seeing my oncologist, because I go to him every two to four weeks, and he and his um, um, uh, uh, assistant were wearing masks. They had a very severe case of the flu. They were drooling, they were sneezing, they, their eyes were red, they, they were in terrible shape. So the two of them were in this little closed room with me. And interestingly, half the staff of the hospital had the flu, and 100% of everybody that works in the hospital had to get the flu vaccine. That's kind of interesting in and of itself, but we're not going to go into that. So they had a severe case of the flu. And because I have theoretically a very compromised immune system because of my disease, I have a disease, a cancer of my plasma cells, which creates antibodies that prevents viruses and bacteria. Therefore, I am susceptible to any and every bacterial and viral infection. So I thought, oh my God, here I am exposed to them, even though they're wearing masks, I'm gonna get sick, but I didn't get sick. And this is three months ago. So I, I believe I have a very strong immune system, even though I theoretically have a very weak immune system. And I think my immune system is strong because of my cancer protocols. It includes the carnivore diet, as well as supporting my uh, gut microbiome. I currently take no medications except for a blood pressure medication. I'm on no prescription pain meds. Uh, occasionally, I might take an ibuprofen when I need it, but frequently I don't need it. I'm, I, if I take anything, maybe once a week, once every other week. And I walk outside approximately a mile a day, usually every day or every other day at least. And I do body weight exercises at home, you know, albeit modified, but I am doing body exercises with modified squats and modified um, push-ups. I have limitations. I can't fly in an airplane. That would be impossible for me. Um, I have trouble fly, driving in a car long distances because my legs and hips start to get really uncomfortable. Uh, I have pain every day, but it's tolerable. And like I said, I don't usually have to take medicine for it. I have a compromised right arm because like I mentioned, I had my right humerus fractured when I fell in August of 2019 in my bathroom. They never said it because they sent me to hospice to die. So I was ready to die, um, so they didn't set my right arm. And here's what my right arm looks like today. If you look at it, this is my right arm, the right humerus. If you look at the bone and you see these big dark areas in my bone, those are the holes, the numerous lytic lesions. But if you look at the right arrow, it's pointing to what looks like another elbow. Actually, this is the fracture in my right humerus as of today with healing around it from a callus. So my healing actually is pretty good and if I had my arm set at the same time as my femur was set, it would be a normal humerus, but right now it's not. So I have some limitation, but interestingly, I can get around with it pretty well. So time goes by, I'm doing very well, and um, around May, I see my oncologist and he says, you know, it would be very interesting and helpful if we got a new PET scan to see where we are with our, your bone cancer cells. So I had a PET scan when I was diagnosed in September of 2018, which showed many, many areas of um, bone cancer in, throughout my, my bone tissues and soft tissues throughout my body. And then when I had another PET scan in June, it showed the same thing. Um, not much progression, but certainly no remission. And 
Then May 8th, I had this third PET scan. So I have the PET scan, it's from head to toe. You go into a little machine and, and they do what they have to do. And from the tip of my head to the, to the tip of my toes, they scan my entire body. They injected me, of course, like I mentioned, with radioactive glucose. So if there's any cancer cells, the scan would show, it would literally light up in different areas where the cancer cells were. So my oncologist calls me and um, he calls me the night of the scan. So the scan is May 8th, the Friday morning. He calls me Friday night. Like I said, it's a 20, uh, a total body scan, 21 months after my diagnosis. And he says, Al, make sure your wife gets on the speakerphone. And I said, sure. And he starts telling me, reading me the, the results of the PET scan. And basically, the, the radiologist said that there was, there was no evidence of any active cancer cells throughout my entire skeleton. I now, that's a major statement here. I had him repeat it several times so that I made sure that I understood him correctly. I haven't seen him yet. I'm actually going to see him next Tuesday. I know that I have some other residual proteins in my bloodstream that are part of the malignant plasma cells, but these residual proteins probably are from some of the cancer cells that are still dying and dead particles that need to be gobbled up by immune by my immune system so i'm i can't say i am remission in remission i can't say i am cured yet but i can say i have no active cancer cells and to me that is amazing so basically my cancer protocols I believe my unconventional cancer protocols supported my body in, in a natural way to heal and get my body to the point where it is. I cannot tell you that any one thing turned the corner. I certainly can tell you that the research of the carnivore diet supports not only remission, but cures for cancer in Paleo Medicina Clinic in Budapest, Hungary. I know that diet in general has a lot to do with cancer. And I know that a healthy gut has a tremendous amount to do with cancer as well as a healthy immune system. So all of the things that I have said and, and been doing since September 2018, which I've tweaked quite a bit, I change it as I see fit and I learn more, I believe that this has helped my body to really become extremely healthy. And most of the things that I have done with my cancer protocols, anybody and everybody should be doing to enhance their immune system to, to make it um, effective in healing other potential infections and preventing chronic diseases. So my cancer protocols are available. It's, I have it on a PDF. And if anybody is interested in a copy of it, if you just go to my website, uh, drdinenberg.com, under contact, you can send me a, a little message through my website, or you can email me directly, al at drdinenberg.com. Just ask me for the PDF. I'll send it on to you. It goes into all the details of what I do, what I take as far as supplements, how I eat my carnivore diet, what I actually um, buy from the stores and what, what, what my diet on a daily basis looks like, um, the supplements that I take for my gut, my immune system, everything is detailed where I got my pulse electromagnetic field mat and how I use it on a daily basis. All of this is detailed and it is for um, your use and sharing it for anybody and everybody. Unfortunately, I can't take any questions because this is not a live performance. But if you have any questions and you really want some answers, again, go to my website and go to contact, write your questions. I will answer anybody and everybody. Or just email me directly at al at drdannenberg.com. And I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to share this uh, 
this life-changing story for me. Thank you.